All right. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our webinar on the federal advocacy agenda. My name is Priya Chaya, and I'm the Associate Director of Content here at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And I wanted to welcome you to today's session. Um, today's webinar is actually one in a series of webinars we are hosting prior to Pass Forward Online 2020, which is right around the corner, actually. Um, earlier sessions included training on grassroots advocacy, preservation law and easements, and understanding climate change. And once I hand things over to our first speaker, I will drop in links for you to access the recordings for those. But before we begin, there are a few technical logistics. Um, First of all, um, if you are attending this webinar, you are required to follow the Passport code, code of Conduct, and I'll drop that link in a moment in the chat as well. Um, we will take questions from the audience during the webinar. There are actually going to be two places where we will stop and take questions, um, and we will indicate when that is. But you should feel free to submit questions at any time using the Q&A panel at the bottom of the your Zoom sort of webinar screen. Um, if you put the question in the chat, I will direct you to place it in the Q&A box because it's easier for, to track, for us to track during the session. However, you can feel free to use the chat to talk to each other during the sessions as well. Um, we have enabled closed captioning for this webinar and you can find that um, information at the bottom of your screen too to enable it. And then following the program, we'll send out a recording of today's session in a follow-up email, along with any additional links and information that we have shared out during this session. Um, and all of these webinars and anything else, um, all of the other pre past four webinars are hosted in the Preservation Leadership Forum webinar library, which I, I will also include in the follow-up email. And now I'm gonna hand things over to Shaw, who is the Vice President for Government Relations for the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Shaw, take it away. Well, thank you, Priya. Thanks for getting us started and welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining today's webinar. Uh, we're glad to have you with us. Uh, so this webinar is designed to inform our conference attendees and particularly those who intend to participate in our federal advocacy program uh, about the key historic preservation policy priorities and where those priorities currently stand in Congress. So if you have not yet signed up for the Pass Forward Conference, I encourage you to do so and encourage your colleagues to do so. And if you are attending, but have not yet signed up for federal advocacy, uh, please consider joining uh, your state captains who are organizing these meetings. Uh, I think with this webinar, you'll have all you need to, to engage and jump right in. So I also wanted to point out that the webinar is not limited to passport attendees and is open to anyone interested in preservation advocacy at the federal level. Uh, the webinar is being recorded as Priya noted. Uh, and if there are colleagues that uh, you know were unable to attend today's session, please do encourage them to review the webinar, uh, which, which as Priya said, will be located on preservation forum uh, website. So uh, one thing I did wanna also mention, we'll be uh, describing some of the one pagers uh, that have been developed for preservation uh, advocacy. We'll have one pagers on the historic tax credit, historic preservation fund and the public lands work. Uh, so we encourage you to familiarize yourselves with those uh, and to use them going forward. So with that, let me uh, describe where we're gonna go with this uh, uh, webinar. We have a great lineup of panelists uh, with us today who will describe some of the work that is being done in support of historic preservation on Capitol Hill. So we'll start uh, first with Russ Carnahan, president of Preservation Action and former member of Congress representing Missouri's third congressional district from 2005 to 2013. Uh, who's going to walk us through a number of key strategies for engaging with members, uh, a member of Congress and their staff. Uh, next, we'll, we'll hear from uh, Patrick Robertson. Uh, we're happy to have him with us. He's with Confluence Government Relations, uh, who also leads the Historic Tax Credit Coalition's government relations work. Uh, and he's going to speak about the critical advocacy opportunity that we have before us as it relates to the federal historic tax credit. 
I'm going to follow Patrick uh, with a description of some of the exciting new developments that we're seeing around the F fiscal year 22 appropriations and the remarkable support that we're seeing for historic preservation as part of that. At that point, we're going to pause uh, for any questions from the audience before hearing from our next panel of experts uh, and give folks uh, a chance to, to weigh in and for the, for the panelists to answer questions. At that point, we're going to pause for, uh, sorry, after our interim Q&A, we're going uh, to uh, hear from Kelly Hummerkauser, Director of Relations for Main Street America. We'll talk about uh, some of the priorities for Main Street and some of the uh, priorities for them uh, with some of the agencies that we don't typically uh, work with uh, in historic preservation. So that I think will be illuminating. Then after that, we're gonna turn things over to my colleague, Pam Bowman, uh, who will be presenting and introducing guest stars, Dan Sakura, president of Sakura Consulting and longtime conservation and preservation advocate, and Aaliyah Jones, legislative staff and Senator Chris Kuhn's office of uh, Delaware, who's gonna talk about, uh, they are gonna talk about efforts to advance the Amache National Historic Site Act and the Brown v. Board Education National Historic Site Expansion Act, respectively. We're, we're very thrilled that both of you could be with us today and we're looking forward to hearing from you. And then finally, we're gonna wrap up with a final Q&A session uh, where we'll answer questions, pose questions to the, the panelists for the entire presentation, and we'll try to try to get through those as well. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Russ. Shaw, thank you very much. It's great to be with you and great to be with uh, those of you joining uh, this uh, advocacy program in the run-up to the past four conference. Um, I am president of Preservation Action since 2015, and uh, we have a long history of collaborating closely with the National Trust uh, on issues in Washington. Uh, in fact, in our uh, bylaws of the organization, the uh, president of the board of the National Trust uh, recommends a representative to serve on our board, and they, uh, Shaw Spry, is that representative. Uh, so we've been uh, especially thankful to work with Shaw uh, and uh, see his leadership uh, and uh, recent uh, promotion, in fact, at the National Trust as a VP of Government Relations. Um, I want to go on to the next slide, and I want to talk a little bit about a quick overview of Preservation Action. Uh, we were founded in 1974. Uh, we are the only national grassroots organization dedicated entirely to lobbying for federal legislation to further historic preservation efforts. And uh, we want to continue to make historic preservation a national priority in utilizing citizen grassroots advocates uh, as some of the best advocates that there can be in Washington. And so uh, we have, uh, we coordinate with the uh, SHIPOs and TIPOs and other national groups on the uh, annual advocacy, historic preservation advocacy week uh, each March in Washington. Uh, we do legislative briefings on the Hill. Uh, we uh, normally do an event uh, in the fall in conjunction with Pass Forward and do a number of education, training and advocacy events uh, throughout the year. Uh, and um, Let's go on to the next slide. Um, I want to talk about uh, really communicating with your elected officials. There seems to be a lot of mystery about that. And having been uh, on the receiving end of advocacy as an elected official in our state legislature and in the US Congress, uh, let me take a little bit of mystery out of that. Uh, first of all, uh, legislators, uh, really value relationships from their local communities and knowing about local projects and events and also being well informed on issues and learning how they connect and make a difference locally. Uh, they really value that kind of information and they value uh, those kind of relationships to put it to work uh, in national legislation that has local impact. So 
uh, it's gotten easier with technology to identify and stay in touch with your elected officials. Uh, you know, you can Google your state's congressional delegation and find out who your two U.S. senators are and your uh, House delegation and your particular House member. Uh, you can look at the relevant committees to identify if they're on a key committee uh, that authorizes uh, programs around historic preservation or if they're on an appropriations committee. Uh, you can also check to see if they've sponsored key uh, legislation in the past about historic preservation. So uh, uh, really four different areas I would encourage you, I, I'll call these the four R's uh, about relationships, repetition, uh, reliable information, and real constituents. Um, first relationships. Um, you don't want to be introducing yourself uh, in an ideal situation to your elected official or staff when you have an urgent crisis or problem. Um, the best way to do that is to have an ongoing relationship. Uh, so you can imagine the difference in a reception at a congressional office if uh, you or your delegation are part of a group that's you know there on an annual basis or they've co connected with local events in your community. Uh, and they can they can make that connection and understand who you are, what you're about, uh, versus showing up for the first time when you've got a, a an urgent issue. Uh, so those relationships are part of the continuum, uh, and uh, with your representative uh, looking for opportunities to connect their work in Washington, uh, but also looking to connect with uh, them and their staff on local events. Uh, there are many opportunities to do that, and members and staff are always looking, I can tell you, uh, to look for places to go, special events um, in their local communities uh, that help highlight the work they're doing in Washington. So take advantage of that and, and get to know the local staff in your community and um, be sure you offer those kind of, inv of invitations. Uh, secondly, repetition. Again, this is not a one-time thing. Uh, think of things you can do throughout, throughout the year. It's not difficult to connect with your uh, member office uh, through uh, advocacy efforts, uh, through uh, letters that are done online where it can automatically be directed to your member. Uh, so take advantage of those opportunities of repeat appearances in front of the office, uh, build that relationship. And then next, reliable information. Um, Members get bombarded with literally thousands of bits of information on, on issues across the board, uh, but become a reliable resource uh, for your member. Congress and legislative bodies always make better decisions when they have reliable information uh, that, and, and time to digest that and incorporate that into legislation and they get better results. Uh, oftentimes when Congress makes bad decisions, They've rushed, they haven't consulted with key experts, uh, and, and then they often have to go back and clean up something quite right. So be that reliable resource of information. And then finally, connect with real constituents. Uh, members of Congress are elected. Uh, I know I'm saying the obvious here, but they care about their constituents and their voters. Um, and uh, when you're connecting them with real live constituents who can vote for them, uh, that can talk about real projects in their district, you know, real special events around historic preservation that you can invite them to, they can participate in, you know, be a, be a, a featured speaker uh, for those events. Those are great ways to build that relationship, but also for them to understand the impact of uh, legislation and programs that they deal with uh, year after year. Um, and we've seen uh, with historic preservation, a number of successes and a number of, of challenges where you're either on in offensive or defensive positions. Uh, one of the most infamous was, of course, the a few years ago uh, efforts to completely el eliminate the federal historic tax credit. And I know we're going to hear more about that later on in the program, but that really was a defining moment, I think, among the preservation moment movement to see how people came together multiple organizations, national, state, and local came together to advocate, to make the local case for the federal credit. And I think the success 
of turning that around, saving the federal historic tax credit, was uh, really show the, the historic preservation movement and advocates what we can do when we work together. Uh, so we've taken that same kind of spirit and energy and success uh, to go forward. And um, we've seen appropriations, you're gonna hear that more about that, uh, have been at record levels recently and gone up gradually each cycle. And that's, a, a, that's part of uh, you know, the impact of really successful advocacy efforts and uh, preservation action work that, uh, that is being done through the National Trust has been a key part of that. So um, I believe that is, I don't think there's another slide. Uh, I think that this is a, one more slide. So this is a, a shot uh, honoring uh, Congressman Darren LaHood uh, with Frank Butterfield from Illinois. Uh, we have a number of key champions in the Congress that have stepped up on historic preservation issues. Uh, be sure to watch for the opportunity to join a hybrid version of uh, Historic Preservation Advocacy Week coming up in March of 2022. And uh, we hope you all will uh, really participate uh, in the Pass Forward Advocacy events uh, coming up uh, and just use that as a starting point to uh, continue that kind of repetition and relationship building that is so critical to advancing the historic preservation issues. So I look forward to your questions, and uh, I know you're going to uh, benefit from hearing the rest of the panel uh, to really show this is really accessible, doable, it's not difficult, uh, it doesn't take a lot of your time, but really makes a big difference for uh, historic preservation advocacy and uh, continuing those programs nationally. Thanks so much. I think that uh, brings me up. Uh, my name is Patrick Robertson. Uh, and as Shaw noted, I'm a principal at Confluence Government Relations, uh, also the lobbyist for the Federal Historic Tax Credit Coalition. Uh, if we can go ahead to the next slide, I'm going to take a few minutes to um, sort of drill down on the things that Mr. Carnahan talked about and get specific about issues uh, on advocacy. Uh, the Historic Tax Credit Coalition is a group of folks who care about the historic tax credit from around the country who use it uh, or want, want to use it. And we are um, sort of the largest uh, DC-based advocacy organization. As Mr. Carnahan noted, um, Preservation Action uh, has the grassroots side of things locked up and they do a great job at that. Uh, and we do uh, a little bit of um, a little more traditional sort of DC lobbying. Um, the coalition retains three lobbying firms, including mine, to go out and spread the word about the federal historic tax credit. Uh, you know, one of the things, the points that Mr. Carnahan made is uh, that sustained advocacy is so important, and it is. Uh, the other thing I'll note to you is um, as much as you all might read otherwise in the newspaper or uh, see otherwise on TV, uh, members of Congress and their staffs really don't want to hear from lobbyists all that often. Um, I'm able to um, go in and sort of make the technical case and answer questions and, and uh, lay the groundwork. But what really always drives home our advocacy efforts is when folks from uh, members' home districts or senators' home states are able to talk about projects or talk about ongoing things in the community and relate them, uh, in our case, to the federal historic tax credit. So uh, that's a really important part of everyone's work and something we all need to do and uh, is much appreciated and quite effective. Uh, I, as I noted, I'm here to talk about the federal historic tax credit, which is the federal government's single largest investment in preservation. Um, as you all may or may not be aware, the federal historic tax credit uh, ends up costing the federal government about a billion dollars a year uh, in foregone tax revenue or in tax credits. Uh, so that's a billion dollar investment in, in rehabilitation across the country. And more than that, uh, it's a 20% credit, right? So that means that it's an additional $5 billion every year in private capital that goes into rehabilitation projects. So a billion from the federal government, 5 billion from the private sector, uh, $6 billion a year into preservation because of the credit. Now, uh, 
um, we talk a lot about what would preservation look like without this and and would people really do the same things? Certainly there are buildings that we would be preserved to the same level uh, as they are now using the federal historic tax credit, but there are a lot that, that would. And uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Historic Tax Credit Growth and Opportunity Act and the uh, budget reconciliation process, uh, which are two really long, boring, Washington insider kind of terms. But here's what it boils down to. Uh, those things, the which include improvements to the Federal Historic Tax Credit um, are the most significant improvements to that HTC since it was put into the law permanently in 1986 in tax reform. Since then, um, it's had a few pieces chipped away. It's had a couple of additions, uh, but certainly nothing like what we're looking for now. Um, I, I will describe the process and then I'll describe the bill, I think. Um, Process-wise, the House Ways and Means Committee has passed a bill that includes all the enhancements for the federal HTC that the coalition and the trust and Preservation Action and others have endorsed uh, going forward, plus a couple that were, or at least one that was new, which is great. Uh, and uh, in addition, um, we are now waiting on this final uh, reconciliation package to pass the House and ultimately the Senate. And that's what you read about, about all the Manchinema negotiations and Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema trying to change the Biden uh, proposal and they need 50 votes in the Senate and all these things. So what your members need to hear now, if you're supportive of the federal historic tax credit, is you want to see those HTC uh, improvements in included in the final bill. And that's what we're asking people to say. Our message is pretty simple. Um, if we can go ahead on to the next slide. Uh, I, the Federal Historic Tax Credit Coalition put out a video last week or a week and a half ago or so um, with a few, um, a little bit of an illustration of what it looks like for um, a building that is rehabilitated. Uh, and, and one of the taglines in our social media was more credit, more value, more buildings, more uses, more simplicity, right? And that's, that's what the Historic Tax Credit Growth and Opportunity Act does. Uh, there are five provisions plus sort of a sixth one, there's an increase to 30% in the credit for all deals for five years to help economic recovery from the pandemic, which has been devastating to historic preservation and HTC projects. There's a bump in the credit to 30% permanently for all small deals, so deals under two and a half, three million dollars in credits. Uh, there is um, a change in the adjusted basis rules. So you only have to spend 50% of your adjusted basis uh, on substantial rehab. So your building doesn't have to get to totally run down to be able to use the credit, but it can be um, in, in sort of moderate shape and you can use the credit. Uh, it allows nonprofits to use the, the credit a lot more easily. Um, it allows them to uh, stop jumping through some of the hoops uh, that they need to jump through uh, to use the credit for buildings they own. Um, and finally, it eliminates the basis adjustment, which means we won't tax the federal historic tax credit, right, at disposition of the building. But it also means that it's easier to pair with LIHTC and Opportunity Zones and other things because those don't have basis adjustments. Uh, so I know Priya and Patrick Grassi are going back and forth in the chat about uh, the one pagers, but those are up and the one pager on the uh, HTC Go bill will give you a little better sense of what's in there and what's going on. Um, for you to go to. Um, but what I want to talk about today is really um, how you can take what Mr. Carnahan told you about advocacy and um, what you think of the historic tax credit and put those together. Um, right now, the most important group of people are the 50 Democratic senators in the United States Senate who are um, negotiating the final contours of this Build Back Better reconciliation plan. They started at three and a half trillion dollars, right? They're looking to potentially cut down to one and a half trillion dollars of spending. Um, Senator Manchin, who's a Democrat from West Virginia, has said that he's comfortable at that one and a half trillion dollar number. Senator Cinema is a little less clear on where she's comfortable, but she's questioned some of the tax increases. And so we're in this spot where some of these changes to programs that we care about, like the HTC, 
may not end up in that final package. Um, and uh, the only way we're going to push back on potentially limiting the HTC provisions is by letting our members of Congress and especially our Democratic senators know where we stand and it's something that we want uh, them to be for. Uh, again, as Mr. Carnahan said, these people stand for re-election. Uh, they have to come to you to keep their jobs every two or six years, depending on if they're in the House or the Senate. Uh, and they care about what you think. Uh, and as I've said, I can talk till I'm blue in the face, right? Uh, but but when, it's, well, when what I'm saying is backed up by local on the ground knowledge and projects that they know and buildings that they've heard of and potential new projects that they drive by and wonder why that building's still empty, uh, that sort of translation makes all the difference in the world. I did leave out one provision that's in that reconciliation bill, and that's Dwight Evans, who's from a member of Congress from Philadelphia on the Ways and Means Committee, also included a provision that will allow the HTC to be used on public schools. Uh, and so that's a, another expansion that fits into these five mores, right? Again, more credits, more value, more buildings, more uses, more simplicity, um, but it's just an extra provision in there. So um, how do you advocate? What do you do? right? How, how do you get to people? And what I always say is you want to do just three things, right? You want to reach out to the office either by phone or by email or by running into your member of Congress uh, at home uh, or calling or, or whatever. Uh, and you want to let them know who you are, uh, let them know what you care about and why, and then let them know what you want them to do, right? So in my case, I would call uh, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, because I'm from Washington, D.C., and I'd say, Congresswoman Nor Norton, um, I live down the street from you on Capitol Hill, uh, and I really care about the Federal Historic Tax Credit. It's done enormous good on Capitol Hill. It's rehabilitated the old Naval Hospital, which is now the Hill Center. It was used to rehabilitate Union Station. We've seen it used on Barracks Row and elsewhere, but we have a ton of building stock left to do, and those deals are getting harder and harder. The credit has been uh, seen its value reduced over the last few years, especially when it was moved to five years in tax reform instead of a one-year credit. So we need the changes in, in the infrastructure bill, in the reconciliation bill, to make sure that the rest of our community can take advantage of this. Uh, DC is one of the places that gets really good use out of the federal historic tax credit. And we need to keep that going. Please support the HTC provisions in, in the reconciliation bill. And that's it, it's as simple as that 30 seconds. Uh, you can do that in email. If you have a project that's waiting for these provisions, even better. Um, if you have friends or developers, lawyers, accountants, uh, investors, whoever it is, you can all send the same email uh, and introduce yourselves in the email and sort of copy everybody. Uh, if you're coming for past forward uh, and are willing to bring this up as part of your advocacy day, I think that would be great. Um, and, and that's really, that's really all we need in terms of advocacy for the HTC. We need sustained advocacy. Um, I'm gonna put the Historic Tax Credits Twitter handle in the uh, chat right now. So if anybody wants to go grab that video I referenced, it's in our uh, Twitter feed a number of times and will continue to be reposted over the next week or so. Uh, you're welcome to use that and tag your members and talk about um, preservation in the HTC. So, I think I've hit exactly the amount of time I was supposed to talk uh, as my clock hits 3.30. Uh, so I think I get the pleasure of turning this back over to my friend, Shaw Sprague, uh, who you've all heard from already, um, but who's gonna talk through um, the HPF now and we'll come back and take questions. I'll just note the slide that's up there now are those uh, six pieces of the legislation that I referenced. Uh, and it, you'll have this slideshow for reference in the future or the one pager uh, that's on the trust website. So, Sha, with that, I'll hand it to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, appreciate that, that great overview and, and what the ask is now on HTC. And I also wanted to thank everyone who has already reached out to their member of Congress uh, in support of the historic tax credit, particularly those Senate Democrats who uh, will control that reconciliation process. Uh, we are close, closer than we've been uh, in, in a generation and more, but uh, certainly as Patrick noted, by no means a guarantee. So uh, please keep up your advocacy over the next several weeks uh, as we see this infrastructure legislation continue to develop on Capitol Hill. 
uh, and help us secure this, this critical victory for the preservation movement. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so here I wanted to take a moment to describe some of the really truly exciting support that we've seen for the Historic Preservation Fund over the last year. And uh, as most of you likely know, the Historic Preservation Fund supports the work of state and tribal historic preservation offices, uh, and they perform a number of critical functions, including Section 106 review, national register nominations, and uh, tying into Patrick's uh, presentation, historic tax credit review, among other, among other functions. Uh, this is going to be particularly critical as we see the infrastructure package move through and the significant amount of infrastructure funding and projects that we're likely to see. So that's going to be a huge uptick in work for SHPOs uh, and TIPOs, and uh, they're going to need that, that funding support to continue to do their work. The other key piece of the HPF uh, is that it supports a number of grant programs uh, listed uh, on the chart to your right uh, that support the preservation of important civil rights sites, historically black colleges and universities, survey grants for underrepresented communities, smaller town community grants in the Paul Brune Historic Revitalization Grants, and the Save America's Treasures uh, grant program. Uh, and as you can see from the chart, the HPF is having uh, a pretty remarkable year. On May 28th, uh, in the president's budget, uh, we saw the president uh, recommend to Congress $151.8 million uh, for the Historic Preservation Fund in FY22. That is significant for a number of reasons. Uh, one, it is more, more funding recommended from any administration in the past. So that is exciting. Uh, and it is also more than the authorized amount. The authorized amount for the HPF is 150 million per year. So we're seeing the administration recommend uh, funding above the authorized amount. That's, that's noteworthy. Uh, and then uh, about a month later on June 29th, uh, we saw the House Interior Appropriations Bill uh, move and, and get passed by the House with 155.8 million for the HPF. Uh, this is already an uptick from the previous year's enacted level of 144 million. Uh, so we're, that's already a, a noteworthy increase. And these are, these are the highest amounts we've seen supported for the HPF uh, that we've seen. Uh, we, we see increases for SHPO funding, big increases for TIPO funding, uh, and significant increases in funding for the HPF grant programs, particularly civil rights grants and Save America's Treasures. But the, the significant news of the week, however, is the release of the Senate Interior Appropriations Bill uh, that provided a stunning 180 million for the HPF. Uh, we saw a repeat of 10 million uh, in funding for the semi-quincentennial fund uh, that honors our nation's 250th anniversary, uh, as well as key priorities of Senate Appropriations Chairman Patrick Leahy above what uh, the uh, preservation partners had have, have, has recommended. Uh, so uh, we're incredibly excited by that, but. The key, another key piece of that is for the first time, uh, we're seeing congressionally directed spending. I'm not going to use the disfavored term of earmarks, but that is the colloquial there uh, in, in the Senate uh, uh, mark. So there are approximately 37 projects that are proposed for funding that total approximately 15 million of, of that 180. I think we can move to that next slide, please. So here are a few uh, project examples that, that uh, uh, were represented in the Senate mark. And of course, that doesn't mean it's final, but uh, this is a pretty extraordinary step to, to see direct funding uh, uh, to projects through the Historic Preservation Fund. Um, and this is significant 
for a few reasons. One, that we're seeing congressionally directed spending come back uh, and, and be applied to the Historic Preservation Fund after more than 10 years of the, the earmark ban that has in, uh, been in place. And secondly, this is important for our efforts to reauthorize the Historic Preservation Fund. Uh, the fund expires in 2023, and so we have begun conversations with our champions on the Hill about efforts to reauthorize that. And some of the things that we're considering are uh, whether to make the authorization permanent, which would help us uh, avoid having to uh, campaign on a regular basis for reauthorization of the Historic Preservation Fund, which has been in place for you know, 50 years. Uh, so uh, uh, perhaps it's come time that we don't have to justify its value to the nation uh, every few years. So that would be an important step but also increasing the authorization from 150 million. And you know, had Congress appropriated uh, looking to stay under that authorized amount, it might've made our case a bit more challenging to, to, to increase that uh, 200 million a year, 250, $300 million a year. We saw Congresswoman Leisure Fernandez uh, amend the invest act in the house to increase that authorization to 300 we want to build off that momentum and now we're seeing the uh the support for going above that authorized amount uh and now that we have that senate number out there uh a very clear demonstration that congress and the administration uh see the need as exceeding that authorized amount so i, I think that uh bodes well for our efforts to to increase that uh, fund and, and initiate a very uh, uh, effective and compelling campaign for the Historic Preservation Fund and its reauthorization. Uh, just one quick note on those projects. I'll point out that they do range from about 100,000 up to 500,000. Uh, so these are just a few examples uh, in Wheeling, West Virginia, uh, in Alaska, uh, Ohio and Virginia, we're seeing uh, these great projects uh, get the attention they deserve from, from uh, the federal government. Uh, I think we can go on to the next slide. Uh, one, this, is, this is the one pager, if you haven't uh, taken a look at that already, uh, the one pager for the HPF. Uh, but before getting to that, one other piece I wanted to note was that the House Natural Resource Committee, as uh, it put together its recommendations for the reconciliation bill, included $75 million for historic preservation activities for the National Park Service. Uh, we are pushing to make sure that the Senate includes uh, similar funding in its version of the bill. Uh, and again, this... Uh, you know, while we don't know for sure how the, what the intent was behind where this money would go within the National Park Service, uh, presumably a good chunk of it would go toward HPF, uh, which would certainly help with, with uh, the, the grant programs, which are by and large uh, job creating bricks and mortar type projects, as well as the support that SHPOs and TIPOs need uh, in the face of uh, this influx of infrastructure investment. So for my, my last piece here, I did just want to flag this one pager. It includes a lot of uh, history about the Historic Preservation Fund, what it does, uh, the role of SHPOs and TIPOs, uh, a summary of that chart again of the grant funding, uh, and then another chart which basically shows how uh, uh, funding has not kept pace with demand. So we look forward to your advocacy and support of the Historic Preservation Fund. And um, you know, that will be a, a number of thank yous to the Senate uh, as you reach out there uh, and encouragement to, to move forward with that Senate number. So with that, uh, I think we turn to our first Q and A. Um, so let me take a look here. I see some conversation in the chat. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, is there a list of all the states seeking earmarked funding in the Senate proposal? Uh, to be perfectly honest, 
we, we the trust, didn't know that uh, there would be this significant uh, number of, of projects directly funded through the HPF. There is a list. We can uh, circulate that hopefully in the chat on this call. Um, but we'll see what this means in the future. Uh, will uh, will states and entities be pushing uh, projects in the future? I would think so. So uh, we're excited to, to uh, make everyone aware of this and, and to think just a little bit differently about the HPF going forward. Next question, uh, is it appropriate to contact a congressperson and or senator in a state other than your own? For example, I live in Tennessee, but there's an important project in Ohio that needs their attention. Uh, I can respond to that, and if anybody else wants to jump in, I would say feel free. Uh, I think if you have a direct connection uh, to that project or some uh, uh, direct uh, relationship to it, I think that would be uh, uh, certainly appropriate to reach out to that other, to a senator that isn't your elected representative to express support for it. Uh, as we've heard from Mr. Carnahan and from Patrick, uh, the, the members do respond uh, most to constituents. So I would just keep that in mind as you, as you do that outreach. Yeah, Sean, sure. I would just suggest, uh, you know, if you're able and you have local partners on your Ohio project, right? It's always helpful to have them join you. Uh, it usually gets you uh, either a quicker or a more attentive audience. Uh, and, but at the same time, if there's no one else to speak up for the project and you're the only um, option, then you absolutely should. Let's see one more question, uh, which is, is there any uh, additional info about the 75 million included on the one pagers. Um, I don't believe we put that in. Um, there isn't a ton to say about it other than the fact that it exists. Uh, you know, again, it doesn't specify how those funds would be, uh, spent. And of course, uh, it faces the same challenge that the historic tax credit does in that uh, when the committees were drafting these provisions, they were drafting to the uh, budget committees agreed upon $3.5 trillion bill. Uh, and so there'll be significant cuts. So uh, the messaging on that would be the same, that that needs to stay in the Senate bill. Uh, but again, it faces those same challenges. It would need that, that same uh, uh, advocacy intensity, uh, but there isn't much more than that on, on uh, a description of it other than it exists. So good questions, thanks everybody. Uh, I think we can now move to our uh, next panel. So I will turn it over to Kelly Humkrauser uh, with Main Street. Thanks Kelly for being here. Thank you, Shaw, for having us and for the very good pronunciation of my last name. Uh, as Shaw said, I'm Kelly Hummerkauser. I'm the Director of Government Relations at Main Street America. And um, we're, we're pleased to be here today and tell you a little bit more about uh, Main Street advocacy issues. We're so pleased also that so many Main Streeters are involved with preservation advocacy through Pass Forward. Um, I think we could go to the, to the first slide. Um, for any of you that might be unfamiliar with us, Main Street America is a subsidiary of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And we've been helping to revitalize older and historic commercial districts uh, for more than 40 years. It, today, we are a network of more than 1200 neighborhood-based public-private partnerships from you know, urban to rural areas uh, who share you know, this commitment to building stronger places through preservation-based economic development uh, but as Shaw alluded to you, that means that some of our uh, priorities are going to be outside of just the preservation box, and I'm grateful to be able to uh, tell you about that today and to see so many Main Streeters uh, in the group here. So um, we can go to our, the next slide. So of the priorities, um, you know, right now we are, of course, looking at the historic tax credit and see how influential all of the provisions that Patrick outlined would be to Main Street communities. Um, 
if you are advocating as part of preservation, uh, uh, as part of Pass Forward's uh, Advocacy Day, or if you're advocating just regularly on behalf of Main Street, uh, we we encourage you highly to reach out to your senators. Uh, you know, just just under 50% of all HTC projects are $1 million or less in qualified expenses. And, and so many of those happen with the support of community-based organizations like Main Street programs. And all of the provisions would make those uh, so much more easier to carry out in Main Street communities. Um, so if there uh, is any outreach that you are doing to your senators and you are a Main Street program, we're always eager to hear about that too, to make sure that we are uh, taking account of it. We also have more resources on, on historic tax credit advocacy on our website, but of course, Shaw's provided you, uh, Sean Patrick has provided you with everything you might need um, for the upcoming lobby days. Um, I, as, as again, as Shaw said, the, the, the programs and other priorities that Main Street has are might be in agencies that are just less familiar to the preservation, uh, the preservation movement broadly. Um, but we do believe that, of course, um, you know, Main Street is kind of where, where preservation comes into practice in communities. And we encourage the reuse of buildings through also kind of the active spaces that are built around them and the active uses of those buildings, including small businesses. And of course, during the pandemic, uh, we saw so many other ways that Main Street programs were, were active and reaching out to their members of Congress to support, you know, small businesses and restaurants and other things that are important to us. Um, so I, I would like to tell you a little bit more um, about uh, two programs, one under uh, one as proposed under the reconciliation bill in HUD, and the other is the merging opportunity uh, through the Economic Development Administration. Um, that are all uh, opportunities to enhance uh, our communities, and and you know through that to also enhance preservation uh, because of their uh, kind of you know complementary uses. Uh, next slide, please. So part of, part of what main, makes Main Street districts uh, vibrant is public places, you know, parks, storefronts, placemaking projects, community centers. Um, those are all things that enhance our communities and, of course, enhance our historic structures uh, in our communities. And, uh, you know, we call that civic infrastructure. We're leaning on a definition of that would be civic inter infrastructure. And we've been seeking ways to promote civic infrastructure through uh, the uh, infrastructure and reconciliation processes that have been ongoing. So we're participating with a coalition of public space organizations, uh, parks groups, and other advocates for, um, again, civic infrastructure called Percent for Place. Um, and you know, really the goal of that, of that coalition is be thinking about in the infrastructure uh, you know, discussions, could we, could we advocate for, could we see 1% of, of that infrastructure funding going towards those place-based needs for, for our communities? Um, and the, the answer that we've received when we've been outreaching to uh, agencies and to the White House was the Community Revitalization Fund. Um, the Community Revitalization Fund was proposed uh, by the White House in the Build Back Better agenda as a $10 billion fund uh, for civic infrastructure grants through HUD. Um, now, this program has um, gone through some changes um, as negotiations have continued. It emerged out of the House, um, uh, the House process, at, reduced in size at, at, at $7.5 billion and merged with another program. So now it's called the Community Restoration and Revitalization Fund, but that slight name change and, and the slight uh, change into the program structure to merge it more with housing really doesn't take away from its, its core ability to fund uh, projects that are essential to, to Main Street. So we are really um, working um, directly with, with HUD, with uh, the White House, with Senate offices to try to see this included in the final uh, reconciliation package. Um, we know that, of course, many programs are going to be reduced in scale and size, but we hope that this can be included. And what makes it so wonderful for Main Street is that it would offer the opportunity for Main Street programs to be the direct applicants into this, into this funding for grants for projects in their communities with the assistance of a CDFI or with their city's uh, help as a fiduciary agent so that we could build the capacity of Main Street programs and there'd be additional technical assistance provided by HUD and then would help them uh, work on the projects that are most important to them. Um, and it does include direct references to main streets and storefronts as part of the applicable uses. Um, and so we're very pleased to see that. We also know that, of course, housing is such a huge priority uh, for our communities right now, um, both the lack of housing and the lack of workforce housing. And this would be one way um, to accomplish that. Of course, another way would be with more historic tax credit projects that produce uh, 
upper floor units in, in downtown districts. So um, all, all good ways to do that, but we are um, continuing our advocacy um, for this as part of the reconciliation package. Um, next slide, please. Oh, back one, please. Uh, another um, priority for Main Streets um, has been over the past, of, past two years, really, or, or since the beginning of the pandemic, um, has been to see how Main Street communities can better access funding through the Economic Development Administration. Um, and many of you may have participated in that push uh, in previous iterations of our advocacy. Uh, over the course of the past year, Main Street has been reaching out to really advocate for existing funding as part of um, pandemic response packages to be utilized for Main Street. And we have seen some applicable uses of that. But we're also looking to the upcoming uh, EDA reauthorization process to offer a specific opportunity to really um, make an adjustment to, to how EDA funds in order to make uh, the programs that it is uh, working on more, more uh, applicable to Main Street communities. And uh, we are members of the EDA Stakeholders Coalition, Coalition, and as members of that coalition, we are supportive of the opportunities in the reauthorization process to kind of uh, create more capacity building through EDA that would get money to communities that haven't traditionally been able to access EDA funding and to create more uh, connectivity between EDA's regional model for economic development and some of the more um, disconnected uh, economic development organizations on the ground, including in, in, our, in some circumstances, our Main Street districts who aren't able to establish those relationships for funding. You know, Main Street communities support uh, a diverse, diverse array of small businesses. And we know from recent data that we're able to access from uh, the Paycheck Protection Program that Main Street communities, uh, just our accredited 1,200 programs supported over 1 million jobs that were, um, that were included in PPP applications alone. So, you know, there's a, Main Streets are huge job centers and those are diverse jobs as well. Um, it's not just retail, Main Street programs serve uh, restaurants and accommodations, professional services, healthcare, and retail, but um, you know, many different industries uh, being served there. And all of those different industries and businesses uh, benefit from the place-based support that Main Street programs offer, creating places for, you know, um, uh, obviously redeveloped properties, places where people want to visit, places where it can combine different types of business mix um, to create a thriving district. And our Main Street programs have um, also had negative impacts, of course, due to the pandemic, but also due to that lack of ability long term to kind of access some of that programming um, and, and uh, sponsorship for those projects. So we are seeking now to create a new program through the reauthorization process that would be aimed to support specifically business district entities. Um, you know, what you all need to know if you're advocating um, throughout uh, the lobby days or at any other time is just to make sure that you are aware of the fact um, and making staffers aware of the fact that the EDA reauthorization process does offer an opportunity to promote, um, you know, a, a preservation aligned priority, which is really creating the impetus to have our Main Street districts filled with vital active businesses. Um, and EDA has the ability to help us to do that. Um, and we are um, looking forward to uh, telling you more about this as the, as the reauthorization process comes into focus more. It should be happening over the next few months. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I think we're going backwards, but. So that's, um, that's just a couple of the things that Main Street America is working on in addition to preservation priorities. And we look forward to um, making sure that we are communicating with you all as preservation advocates um, more about how to uh, you know, align with those and, and make sure that you're including the messages for Main Street in your outreach to offices. So thank you very much. Hi, I'll go ahead. Um, hi, everyone. In this uh, last section, um, we wanted to highlight some of the legislative work related to preservation priority issues in the House Natural Resources Committee and Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. Um, switch to the next slide, please. 
Um, many of these um, issues fall into the part of our portfolio where we focus on preserving historic and cultural resources on public lands. Uh, a big component of that work is drafting legislative proposals, helping to advance legislation and providing advocacy resources to the preservation community. Um, but it's also uh, work that we do when these issues intersect with some of the annual appropriations work and also some other policy and regulatory issues. Um, we've definitely seen strong interest on Capitol Hill for preservation issues um, related to public lands, especially over the last two to three years. Um, this work in collaboration with our partners has resulted in some really big wins. Um, one of those we've covered on previous webinars, uh, which was the passage of the Great American Outdoors Act, um, where that invested about $9.5 billion to repair historic and other assets of the National Park Service and other federal agencies, uh, along with fully funding uh, the Land and Water Conservation Fund at 900 million annually. And with the reset and start of the new Congress um, and administration earlier this year, we have a full slate of about 18 pieces of federal legislation that we're actively engaged on. Uh, and the outlook appears great so far. Um, there's been a steady stream of committee and floor activity on many of these bills, a lot of positive conversations by members of Congress at the hearings and markups. So we are hopeful that we'll have additional preservation wins in the near future. And as all of these bills move through the legislative process, their progress has been a little staggered depending on the date of introduction uh, and other uh, items on Congress's agenda. So we're focusing our messaging the next three weeks uh, in, on three bills in particular. And all of those are highlighted on a new one pager that may have already been shared in the chat with you, but um, we can, uh, if not, we can, we can add that. Uh, next slide, please. The first of the three bills that we wanted to highlight is HR 3600, which is the Route 66 National Historic Trail Designation Act. Um, this bill has been one of the focal points of our Route 66 National Treasure, uh, a campaign that's um, taken place over the last two to three years, really highlighting the preservation needs um, of Route 66. And thank you to all of you who have been part of the over 64,000 people who have pledged their support uh, on a petition supporting that preservation work. Um, this particular bill is led by Representative Darren LaHood from Illinois and Representative Grace Napolitano uh, from California. And it would designate Route 66 as a National Historic Trail and a new unit of the National Park System. And that National Historic Tra Trail would stretch through uh, eight states, um, starting in Chicago, Illinois, and ending in Santa Monica, California. It's a very popular uh, bipartisan bill and actually passed the House unanimously in 2018. Uh, and due to a number of um, delays related to some court activity, uh, it was just now reintroduced in this Congress um, over the Memorial Day weekend. And we've really used uh, the summer uh, as an opportunity to highlight the theme of enjoying travel and heritage tourism to continue um, building support for these amazing places. Uh, so you haven't already, um, please take advantage of the resources on our website. I think Priya's shared a few of those in the chat. Uh, and please send a letter to your member of Congress, especially if you're in one of those eight states uh, bisected by Route 66. And I will type those um, into the chat uh, shortly. Uh, next slide, please. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Dan Sakura, uh, who's gonna talk about two key preservation issues, including the Amache legislation. Uh, Dan is the principal at Sakura Conservation Strategies, and his expertise includes over 25 years of experience collaborating with partners nationwide to permanently protect nationally significant properties, including years of experience in senior positions on Capitol Hill and in previous administrations. Uh, his work also includes successfully completing projects to preserve Japanese American confinement sites, African American civil rights sites, national parks and public lands, uh, via administrative actions, legislation, and other work. And so, Dan, I now turn it over to you. Great, Pam. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. 
And I'd especially like to acknowledge the um, great commitment of the National Trust for Historic Preservation to tell uh, the diversity of America's stories, including stories relating to racial justice and healing. Um, next slide. Just a little bit about myself. Um, I have a personal family connection to the Minidoka Relocation Center located in Idaho. Um, there's a picture of my grandparents and my dad and uncles who were incarcerated uh, during World War II simply for the fact of being Japanese American. Next slide. The, during World War II, the US government had a policy to forcibly relocate Japanese, over 110,000 Japanese Americans from the West Coast to, by creating an exclusion zone and creating a vast network of essentially prisons, including 10 large relocation centers uh, of which Amachi located in Southeast Colorado is one of them. And we're very grateful for the opportunity to talk about bipartisan legislation currently pending uh, in the United States Senate to designate Amache as a national historic site, along with uh, Manzanar, Minidoka, Tule Lake, and Honolulu Uli sites in which are units of the national park system. Um, next slide. So just to acknowledge that the Amache site is located on the ancestral homeland of the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes. Um, the park service, if this is added to the national park system would manage Amache uh, located in Southeast Colorado, um, along with Sand Creek Massacre National Historic Site, which commemorates the um, terrible massacre of several hundred uh, Cheyenne and Arapaho tribal members. Sand Creek is a tributary of the Arkansas River, um, which was the um, which parallels the Santa Fe Trail. There's some um, uh, really great historic property along the Santa Fe Trail. Next slide. The Amachi Relocation Center was named after a remarkable woman, um, Amachi Ochini Powers, a uh, Cheyenne Indian whose father was murdered at the Sand Creek Massacre in 1864. Her life and her husband's life, John Powers, um, is told through uh, some really remarkable historic preservation work in Bogsville, Colorado nearby. There's a picture of her, of the John and Amachi Powers home. Next slide, please. So uh, during World War II, the Amachi Relocation Center was where over 9,000 um, Japanese Americans were incarcerated in barracks. You can see a picture of the barracks um, on the left there. Uh, a map of the property of the site shows uh, how vast it was. It was um, one of the largest cities in Colorado at the time. And you can see the, the blocks of barracks and the camp cemetery. Next slide. So one of the really amazing features of Amachi was the fact that it had the highest uh, percentage of military um, volunteers. These are mostly Japanese American men, but also women. 953 joined the military um, out of camp, even though their families were incarcerated behind barbed wire. And um, Amachi also had 31 soldiers who were killed in action, who paid the ultimate price. Um, today, Amachi serves as a memorial. It's where folks that died in camp are still buried. Next slide. And after the war, um, the US government said that folks could not return immediately back to their homes in California where they were originally from, but uh, they could settle in the Midwest and uh, most settled in Colorado, some in the Intermountain West. And so what happened during the war was the government essentially destroyed uh, what are called Nihonmachi or Japan towns on the West Coast and the Japanese American community was spread across the country in a diaspora. They're shown here in the blue lines. Next slide. So Amachi today, here's an aerial shot. Um, you can see the outlines of the foundations. Um, there are very few original contributing structures located on the sites. Most of the sites, uh, most of the structures have been um, 
move to like farms, nearby farms and that sort of thing. It's current, the site is currently managed by a local um, partnership through the Amachi Preservation Society, John Hopper, who's been a real guardian angel uh, for the site for, for several decades. Uh, next slide. So Amachi is primarily a place for healing, for learning, um, for Japanese Americans to have reunions and for other, the public at large to learn about this terrible chapter in our history. Every year, the um, Amachi survivors and descendants organized a reunion or a pilgrimage. And um, it's a place where we can honor those who are no longer with us and to show our children and grandchildren and pass those stories of camp life down um, to the next generations. Um, next slide. So it's been a re really remarkable partnership of partners as from all over Colorado and the United States. I'd especially acknowledge the work of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Um, Barb Paul, who was the Western Regional Director for many years out of Colorado, led a successful effort in 2006 to designate the site as a National Historic Landmark, a finding of national significance. Um, Preservation Inc. has done really remarkable work restoring um, historic structures with financial support from the National Park Service. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge the National Parks Conservation Association, which has led the advocacy effort in partnership with Pam and her team. I'm currently serving as an advisor uh, to NPCA. And there's also been great work with the Sand Creek Massacre Foundation, which tells this, helps the National Park Service interpret the story of the Sand Creek Massacre site. Next slide. So in terms of the legislation, um, we're very pleased back in 2019, Congress passed bipartisan legislation to, spat, to authorize the National Park Service to conduct a special resource study. And the Park Service has started uh, work on that study, has had a series of public meetings, there's been outstanding public support. And then in 2001, um, Congressman Joe Neguse, a Democrat of Colorado, worked with um, Congressman Ken Buck, Republican of Colorado, whose district includes Amachi in Eastern Colorado, to introduce HR 2497. And we're very pleased that the that full house passed this bill by a vote of 416 to two, uh, 48 out of 50 congressional delegations voted unanimously for the bill. And in the Senate, um, Senators Bennett and Hickenlooper from Colorado have introduced companion legislation. And we are grateful that the committee had a hearing on October 6th. And right now our focus is on the Senate Energy and Natural Resource Committee markup. We know there's a number of other bills which uh, you will hear about later, Brown v. Board, that are in a similar uh, situation. Um, in terms of Senate passage, we're hoping potentially it could pass as a standalone legislation. We believe there's enough bipartisan support on both sides for that. Potentially could also be packaged as part of a larger bill, uh, potentially an omnibus public lands bill along with other high priority uh, legislation. Next slide. So in terms of our, um, our asks, and we're really appreciate the opportunity to, to present these to you, one is, to thank uh, our lead Senate champions, Senators uh, Bennett and Hickenlooper from Colorado. They've done remarkable work and we just wanna kind of keep up the, the great momentum. And then in terms of the energy committee, uh, Senator King is the chairman of the park subcommittee. If there's an opportunity for folks from Maine to reach out to him, we'd be grateful. Um, the, the bill enjoys strong bipartisan support from Senator Barrasso, the ranking member, of the full committee, uh, Senator Daines from Montana, the ranking of the subcommittee. And we also have some very interesting connections to other members of the committee. So Senator Marshall from Kansas, um, Japanese Americans were incarcerated at the Leavenworth um, Federal Prison uh, for their views. And in Mississippi at Camp Shelby, um, members of the Amachi uh, folks that joined out of Amachi trained at Camp Shelby in Mississippi. So there's a connection there. And in North Dakota, there's a, there's a site um, that uh, was a prison for men that were separated.
and their families. So there, there, there is a lot of um, connections with other members on the committee. We're also hoping to reach out to uh, Senate leadership, Senator McConnell, and uh, there's actually connections because folks left Amachi and settled in Kentucky. And uh, so we're hoping to, to reach out to him and his team and encourage swift Senate passage. Next slide. So in terms of the timing or questions, um, February 2022 marks the 80th anniversary of um, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signing of Executive Order 9066 in 1942. And this is significant because many of the camp survivors, uh, Bob Fujigami, who's in Denver, who's been a leader in this effort, are in their like late eight, 80s or late or 90s. So time is really of the essence, and we're very hopeful that we can get this bill either standalone or as part of another packet, a broader package to the president's desk for his signature by February 2022. Um, next slide. So switching gears here, um, I'm going to, we're moving up to Idaho. This is a slide in south central Idaho, north of Twin Falls on a line. If you start in Twin Falls, Idaho and drive up towards Ketchum, Haley, Sun Valley area, um, this is a, a proposal from LS Power, which is a New York private equity firm to build 400 massive wind towers, uh, wind turbines located as close as two miles to the Minidoka National Historic Site. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the really outstanding work of the National Trust's uh, Betsy Merritt, Christopher Cody, who just submitted public comments during scoping, uh, which were due yesterday. Um, I don't have a specific ask for this project, but um, I will say that we're there's a panel on Asian American Pacific Islander um, historic preservation in uh, two weeks on November 2nd as part of the Fast Forward, Pass Forward Conference. And I'll be speaking more about the Minidoka project for if you need any information, I'm an advisor to the Friends of Minidoka, which is a nonprofit based in Idaho. It's a National Park Service Friends Group, and its uh, website is minidoka.org. So thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. I really appreciate your time and commitment to telling the full story of America through historic preservation, including new units of the National Park System. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Um, that was an amazing presentation and thank you for sharing those um, images with us and really the compelling case for why uh, preserving the story of the Amachi site is so important. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with you and all of the partners on this issue um, and look forward to a, a successful um, result in this Congress on that legislation. Um, I also have the pleasure of introducing um, Aaliyah Jones, who has been one of the driving forces on a key piece of preservation legislation. Aaliyah Jones is the judiciary aide to U.S. Senator Chris Coons from Delaware and has been on Senator Coons' staff in their D.C. office for almost four years. Aaliyah is a graduate of Delaware State University and has a wealth of knowledge on all things Delaware and the legislative process it's really been a pleasure to work with Aaliyah the past few years on a project regarding the history of the Brown v. Board of Education court case. Um, we can switch to the next slide and I'll turn it over to Aaliyah. Thank you so much, Pam. Um, as you know, uh, Senator Coons is very excited about this important legislation and which he and our office believe is just an important step in remembering the painful but the significant impact the separate but equal doctrine had on our nation. Uh, for background, for the past two years, the National Trust, our office, um, and Representative Clyburn's office have been working together to develop legislation that would tell the full story of the landmark 1954 Supreme Court case um, of Brown v. Board of Education. Uh, this bipartisan and bicamera bill was introduced last fall, and it has 100% co-sponsorship from all of the House and Senate offices representing the expansion sites. Um, we reintroduced this bill earlier this year um, as a just uh, commemoration of um, Black History Month. 
So we were really excited about that. Um, so specifically, what this bill would do is highlight the history. Um, several year, decades ago, the Brown v. Board of Education National Historic Site in Topeka, Kansas was established as a unit of the national park system. However, what many people don't know is that that Brown v. Board of Education case was actually five consolidated cases. Um, court cases. And so Senator Coons himself actually grew up just a few hundred yards from one of the sites connected to this case. Um, but it wasn't until law school that he learned of the school's significance. Um, so each of those cases and the unique stories from these communities tell a compelling story about the civil rights movement and the struggle for educational equity. Uh, the bill would expand the existing Kansas site to include related sites in South Carolina, and it would also establish National Park Service affiliated sites in Delaware, Virginia, and Washington, DC. In Delaware, the bill would create um, National Park Service affiliated sites for three locations. Uh, one of these locations being Howard High School, which is located in Wilmington, Delaware. Um, it is also the only place that um, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke in Delaware. Um, it was the all black school to which plaintiffs, it, the plaintiffs in Belton v. Gabert uh, were forced to travel and it has been designated as a national historic landmark in, rec in recognition of its national significance. Um, the Howard High School, it is now the Howard High School of Technology and it is an active school administered by the Newcastle County Vocational Technical School District. Uh, the other, another site in Delaware would be uh, what is now Claymont Community Center, which was then the all-white Claymont High School. Um, and this school denied plaintiffs admission in the Belton v. Gabert case. Um, and it is currently, um, a, like I said, a community center administered by the Brandywine Community Resource, Resource Council Incorporated. Um, and finally, we have what was the Hocassin School 107C, or Hocassin Colored School. It was the all-Black school in Hocassin that one of the plaintiffs in Belton v. Gabert was required to attend with no public transportation provided. Um, her lawyer, Louis L. Redding, uh, who also helped argue the Brown v. Board case, said, I'm not just going to get you away to the school, I'm going to get you into a school where you could have a better education. Um, and we're really excited about um, the Delaware case because of the five consolidated cases in Brown v. Board, the Delaware decision was the only decision affirmed by the Supreme Court. Um, so it's a proud history for us and one that we'd love to share with others. Uh, we are pleased and excited with the significant progress that this bill has made so far. Uh, both in the House and the Senate, the Natural Resource Committees, uh, subcommittees for national parks had uh, successful markups and we were very excited about that. The House markup happened in April, whereas the Senate markup happened in June. Um, since then, we've just continued working with the National Trust, the National Park Service. Um, we've been working on mapping, collecting more information from the various communities and just preparing the next stages of the legislation. So we've been in constant communication with staff for Senators Manchin and Barrasso on national resource on natural resources. Uh, we expect a markup soon. Um, we may get one in the House before the Senate, but um, we just keep working with them and pushing for it. Um, so we're, prior to the markup, we're going to gather representatives from each of the congressional offices ahead of committee activity. And then following the markups and following committee activity, which hopefully, they will all just pass with flying colors. Um, we expect to get a floor vote on this legislation. Um, we just expect that this bill will continue to receive continued bipartisan support. We have a broad um, bipartisan coalition on this bill. And, um, you know, we're just really hoping that we can just continue to move this bill in the 117th Congress. And we are beyond excited to get this important legislation passed into law. Thanks, Aaliyah. Uh, really appreciate the update and it's been great to work with your office on this. I think we're all excited about the progress so far and we'll be sure to share with all of you 
um, information as soon as we receive it. Um, and I'll now turn it over to Shaw. All right, well, thank you uh, everyone for joining us today. Um, I don't believe I see any questions, so we must have uh, conveyed everything perfectly to everyone. Um, enter those questions now if you have them. Uh, we've got a, a number of great experts uh, here to answer any questions. So take advantage of the moment uh, and, and let's see some of those questions if you've got them. Uh, it's been a long week. Uh, looks like folks are a little quiet today. That's not a problem either. Uh, again, the, record, uh, the, the webinar is being recorded, and so you'll be able to revisit uh, as, as your advocacy uh, ramps up. Uh, feel free, as always, to reach out to uh, the National Trust Government Relations staff with any questions that come to mind. Uh, I do see a question. Question is to Aaliyah, is there a short summary of the legislation? Yes, there is. Um, you can find a short summary on the Senator's website uh, at coons.senate.gov. Uh, if you just type in Brown v. Board, it'll pop up. Um, and it also has links to the actual bill text and you can just get a lot of information there, so. Great, thank you, Aaliyah. Uh, so let me then just take the opportunity to thank everyone for joining today and uh, for our really great panel uh, joining us. Uh, we appreciate your taking the time to, to jump on and describe for the preservation community some of the key priorities uh, moving through Congress right now. Uh, it's, it's clear that uh, you're all doing extraordinary work and that was a wonderful presentations uh, uh, by everyone. So thank you again to the panel for, for taking the time today. Uh, I'll just note uh, a final note that uh, for the advocacy that will be occurring uh, during Past Forward, November 2nd through 5th. Uh, we're hitting at a great time to get it, be getting our message uh, up to the Hill. Uh, this is gonna be right in the midst of a likely decision-making time, uh, but still early enough to, to have an impact and uh, raise the profile of, of historic preservation priorities. So uh, again, thank you for your interest and engagement. Uh, we encourage uh, the ongoing engagement, particularly over these next uh, number of weeks. Uh, but thank you for joining today and uh, feel free to follow up uh, again with the government relations staff uh, as, we, as we move forward. But thank you again and have a wonderful day. <laughs>